Hello and welcome to the Rangers Live podcast. Um, tonight we're joined by, well, at the moment we're joined by Alan and hopefully very soon by John as well. Um, hope everybody's well. Okay, we're just going to jump straight in here because obviously the football season is nearly upon us. Everybody's got a smile back in their face. Rangers are going to be playing in Monday night against Partick Thistle. It's not the most fancy game in the world, but you know we're all looking forward to it. That's all that matters. So we'll jump straight in with the uh, season ticket sales. What do you think of that? Uh, incredible oh, again. Just what you expect. Yeah, I didn't really expect the season ticket sales to go down any for last season after the success. Um, you know, I, I had a look there, it was at 45,000 season tickets have, have been renewed and sold so far. Um, it, it's just incredible. People want to see this team play. They want to see Steven Gerrard's Rangers, the product that he can put on the park with the players that he's got, the players that he's bringing in. It's got better and better every season under Gerrard. You know, Last season, the, the euphoria of it was just incredible. Nanius could get to a, a match. People want to see this. And with the season ticket sales again, we know Ibrox is going to be absolutely buzzing. The first game that there's 50,000 people sitting or standing in Ibrox Stadium, I, I can't wait. I really can't wait. Um, it's, it's something that I, I am looking forward to. And I keep looking at the fixture list and going, when will it be? When will it be? Oh, I, wonder if I'll, I wonder if I'll get my name drawn out the hat to go to the Livingston game. Or, you know, I just, I can't, I can't wait to get back. And I know there's 45,000 other people just like me. Yeah, look, I think that's the buzz, isn't it? It's, uh, it's like that feeling that normality is about to resume again and that people can get back to doing what they love. You know, yeah. we've missed it now for which feels like forever. I know it's only been like 15, 16 months, but it does. It feels like forever. I think this is probably the sort of feeling for guys that maybe stay abroad and maybe they don't get to see ringers that often. That's what it kind of feels like for the last 15, 16 months where you're kind of forced to watch it on the television and it just yeah. doesn't seem right because all you've ever known is just like, you know, following the team as far as you can to the, to the furthest parts of Scotland and abroad. But, you know, the fan base is just incredible. Last season, for people to put their money in their, you know, into the club, knowing that realistically the chances of getting to games last season were probably remote, I thought was phenomenal. And for them to do it again this year, knowing that they potentially might not... I think shows you the fan base is just unbelievably good and that yep. consistently back the club and the players as far as they possibly can, you know, especially in these tough times. I mean, giving up 500, 600, 700 plus pounds is, is a hell of a lot of money. And um, I think the club should appreciate the fans more so this season as well, because it's the second season in the trot that people are going to do it. And I think it's a huge, huge ask. So I really hope that, you know, come the first, second week in August, we do start to see supporters back inside Ibrox. Yeah, you know, you're saying there about the, the, the money. I think the club has asked a lot. Um, I think every club's asked a lot. Um, I know some clubs like Motherwell are doing, making tremendous gestures towards their fans. Um, but I think that that just speaks volumes for our support. Um, yeah. There was very, very low numbers asked for the refund. Um, I decided at the start of last season before we, just, we sort of realised we'd never get into a game, um, I, was going to keep a, I was going to keep a tally of what I was spending on Rangers. Even without getting a game, I'm not going to put I'm not going to put a figure on it because my missus watches the podcast. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to put the number on it because she'll absolutely throttle me. But I expect that to at least double this season. Um, but I don't mind. I, I, I appreciate that if we want to see the team be successful, if we want to see the you know win the league, win the cups, be competitive in Europe, we need the, the fan base. They put their hand in their pocket. I wouldn't expect anybody to put their hand in their pocket and pay something they can't afford. Yeah. But I'm I'm happy I know where my money's going and my money's going to the club. See, five, six years ago, I couldn't guarantee that my money was going to the club. Mm-hmm. And th- that stuck in my throat a wee bit. And it, it made me reluctant to buy things. Um but now I think we've got a much better relationship with the supporters. So um it's, it's yeah. I know where my money's going, so I'm happy to do it. But it's I think this what's happened with COVID and the lockdown last year. I think that's going to have a knock-on effect for a lot of clubs in football, in Scottish football. Um, you know, we've seen other mob around record season ticket sales. Um, we've seen other clubs talk about season ticket sales, even at junior level. 
my local junior team had a game on Saturday, the first home game on Saturday, where they could get a crowd back in. Couldn't they get moving up the street. You couldn't get parked. There was cars everywhere. Um, so right throughout Scottish football, fans are desperate to get back. Yeah. Um, it's a shame the product's not going to be great. It's not going to have improved in the last year and a half. But I think it's absolutely brilliant for Scottish football and all football that fans are getting back. And, you know, the smaller clubs, they might benefit from that because they might see fans coming back that they've not seen for a while, putting their hand in their pocket, getting out of the house. So it, it could be a really positive year for, for Scottish football. Um, the sooner the fans get in, can get in, the better to obviously benefit that. Um, but it, it could be a real... The signs are good. The early signs are good for this season. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things and you're spot on about it is that this could be like a reboot for a lot of football clubs. It, you know, this is where maybe clubs could maybe box smart and maybe bring the prices down with some tickets and it might just entice those extra 20, 50, 100 people for some of the lower league clubs and that money would be more than what they would get most mm -hmm. other weeks. So I think, you know, for football clubs... I mean, I'm obviously going to go and watch some of the B-team games because that's something that I've yeah. got an interest in. So, I mean, I would hope that once everything opens up that maybe there's like a 1,000 people at some of the B-team games and mm -hmm. then at Ibrox, obviously, full stadiums. And I think that's the buzz again into it. I mean, like watching some of the live events, you know, like the Euros, seeing like the tennis and stuff, like seeing so many people inside the crowd. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's something that I'm absolutely buzzing about. Right, we're just going to add John in. He's he's finally back home, so here's one man. Just going to add him into the team. John, how's it going, mate? You all right? Aye, not bad, not bad. How are you guys doing? How's legs? We're just talking about season <laughs> tickets. Feel free to jump in and say how much you're looking forward to the new season. Oh, mate, I can't wait. I can't wait. My legs are killing me. Like I am falling <laughs> apart. I have done. I've done nothing for four months, so I've done a literal zero, like twenty k. You know, just non-stop so it's just burning up in that weather oh it'd be good any other time any other week this weather would be amazing <laughs> it is absolutely horrendous and i'm burnt all my nose oh but yeah season ticket it's nice to know that those direct debits that came out this morning are actually going to be purposeful in a couple yeah. of weeks so buzzing that it's i know i know we've been given false promises on the old uh attendances recently but Fingers crossed this is actually the one and we will be in. We maybe only miss the the first game full capacity and from then on it's battering on. Right, we're just going to jump into the next subject. Obviously, you've kind of just come in at the end of the season ticket chat there. We're just going to have a wee quick chat about the pre-season fixtures. Obviously, the quality of the opposition, what we hope to gain from the games, etc. So looking at it, Partick Thistle away, Tranmere away, Arsenal at home, Blackpool away. Clearly, due to the whole COVID, it's it's difficult. We're not able to go and play, you know, in Germany. We're not able to have like we're breakaway in Spain and etc. Do you think that makes a difference, Alan, or do you think it's just pre-season? You just got on with. It? I I don't know. Um, if you'd asked me that last year, I probably would have said it would make a difference. Um, but I'm I'm not so convinced now. When when the the, the fixtures were announced to start, where I was a bit, um, I'd like to have seen some tough proposition in there, but. Is that the standard of the opposition we're going to be playing week in, week out in Scotland? It probably is. So you can understand why Gerard wants to test the guys against these these types of teams. You you know, although travel's opening up and we can see teams travelling around Europe, it's still not ideal. So, um, you know, that's that's crazy to say considering we went to France last season and played their pre-season tournament. Um, but, you know, it's still not ideal. So you can understand why they want to stay at home as well. But there's, I think there's still a couple of things to get announced. Um, I saw um, I saw somebody on Twitter posting that I forgot about this. We'd announced a pre-season friendly or a friendly at some point with the, the Indian team that we've partnered with. Um, and we've not announced a yeah. date for that yet. I know that'll probably be a PR, a PR stunt more than anything else. Um, but it makes me think there's still maybe a couple of things. Maybe another game is still to get announced. So we'll, we'll see what comes of that. John, what about yourself, mate? Do you think like the level of opposition is good to start the pre-season in terms of, you know, the first game against Partick, for instance, it's not going to be a thriller, is it? It's basically getting the legs going to start the season. Uh, you always used to find it when Walter Smith went to Germany and played like a 17th tier <laughs> amateur football side in Germany and you yeah. won 2-0 and you were like, my God. But I think football <laughs> changed, football's changed so much now. Um, it's not like people going on a two-week holiday and going on a, a booze cruise. And come back unfit. Most of these players go away on holiday with a with a training regime and they're down the gym. They don't come back unfit. So preseason kind of is a few weeks. Unless you're Lee Griffiths. 
Uh, well, yeah, there, 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 there's exceptions to the rule. There's exceptions to the rule, yeah. But um, most people do come back uh, pretty fresh. So, yeah, I think it's just build up slowly. We can't put too much um, in people's legs ahead of our European qualifiers because that's those games to get in the Champions League are, are the most important ones that we're going to have all season, um, especially this side because that's, that's monumental money to get that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the big thing for me is it's just purely getting the legs going again. It's obviously been a decent break for the players this year. Obviously, we, you know, in previous years, we've basically been starting in the first round in Europe in the qualifiers. This year, we've got a wee bit of a break. So the players have actually had a reasonably good break this year. So this will be interesting to see, you know, how good the players are ready to go. And John, spot on. Like, players don't really seem to lose... Their fitness levels don't know everything's just at a peak and as you say they're sent away with their monitors and they're obviously constantly checked for how far they're running each day and things like that it's you know you never really stop now as a professional footballer do you it's just it's a constant thing and i suppose that's the way it's got to be because these guys are paid professionals and they've got to be at that peak level as soon as they walk back in the door although when you see them running a you know kind of round and round at the training ground i'm bloody glad it's not me because I think one of those 400 meter runs, and I would be hoping for a lot of oxygen. Because <laughs> I would be can, struggling. I'm not going to lie. You can um, see how you can see how little players differ for being fitness yeah. freaks now by the nick they get in when they're celebrating a trophy. Like yeah. Ryan, Ryan Jack looked like he had about four beers and couldn't stand up right. Alan McGregor was up the car at home at 5 p.m. These are people who don't drink anymore. They're absolute lightweights and they need to get carted home. It's the same. You see it in these people all the time. So they, they do seem to they'd be boys that drink maybe a couple of times a year. And that's how they end up in these absolute nicks. <laughs> yeah, but here's a question for one of the guys. Uh, he's asking any word in goals since contract yet. Yeah, look, I think that is obviously becoming a growing concern for a lot of supporters. Clearly, you know, Connor was absolutely monumental for us last year. Is it you'll be calling that we might lose Goldson, or do you think it's just the club waiting for the right time to announce the contract? I, I don't know. Um, I, I, it's a strange one. We've got six centre-backs there just now. Um, somebody, something's got to give. Something's got to give. I think Edmondson will be away. We've just signed Simpson. I think he deserves to get a pre-season under his belt. Um, Balogun signed a new contract. He gives us an option at centre-back, a different option at right-back, although we've got Patterson and Tav. Katic is coming back for injuries. I think something's got to give. I don't think it'll be Katic it goes, because who's going to be looking at a centre-back that's been out injured for a year? Um, so it's, it's Hellander or Goldson for me that's, that's going to go, um, as much as I don't want to see either of them go. Uh, I yeah. think at least one of, one of them along with Edmondson is going to go. So... Nothing looks different for Goldson and, and training, um, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I, ho- I hope he stays. I hope, he's like, I hope he gets a new contract announced whilst I'm saying this and makes me look like a complete mug. Um, <laughs> but, but I think for one of them's got to go, and, and they're probably one of the two that we can cash in on as well. So the more it drags on, the more worried they get that we're going to lose them. Here's somebody that obviously knows me very well here in the in the comments. Well, if 400, do you mean 40 metres? Mate, I'm, I'm not going to lie. If I did four metres in this heat, I think I would probably be struggling. So anybody that knows me well knows I'm not a runner. I don't really walk anywhere particularly quickly. And in this sunny weather, it's not a pretty sight seeing a rather big guy doing any type of exercise. So, yeah, there's no chance of catching me running too far, mate, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, John, what about yourself, mate? Is it becoming a concern with Golson, or are you not worried about it? I think he'll see he'll be, he'll be there this season. Um, right. Whether that's him leaving for nothing, I don't know. I think you're better. Honestly, I think at this stage you're better keeping him for the season, and rather than getting a couple of million for him, you keep right. him. You get Champions League football, and you let him go wherever he wants to go. And he goes and signs his either signs a new contract with us, or he goes to somewhere bigger, um, or maybe more lucrative money in the Premier League, and gets his big signing on fee, and he gets his big retirement and paycheck at the end of all that, and he's job's done. As long as he wins us a title, I don't care what his contract situation is. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, that's the fine line of football, isn't it? I mean, getting to the Champions League is so lucrative. Is it worthwhile letting somebody leave on a free to get to the Champions League? Because the 20, 30, whatever it is, million now that you get from the Champions League, 
we could go out and bring somebody else in because you know if you lose Golson in the preseason and you need to bring somebody else in, you know they're clearly not just going to fit straight into the team. So that's the difficulty be moving somebody on and bringing somebody in. And but yeah, again, that's why you know the people above us smarter than us at football clubs that know a lot more than we do. We're obviously just commenting because we don't know exactly what's going on. Um, moving on to the next bit, we're just going to chat about potential incomings. Obviously, we've seen Nambi off a bore. I hope that's right, mate. It's, say your name, mate. I do apologise if it's not. Um, John, what do you know about Nambi off a bore? Less than nothing. <laughs> Less than nothing. <laughs> um, my head has been totally on this license, so I have missed any transfer rumours um, whatsoever this week. So I have like literally been sprung into this. Less than nothing about the kid. I don't even, don't even know where he's from. Don't know who he plays for. Don't know if we need to pay for him. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Mate, you obviously missed the fact we signed up for Brentford at the same time as Jack Simpson, but it's all right, I'll forgive you. Um, <laughs> well, I think the basic thing is he doesn't strike me as the sort of guy that's going to come straight into the first team and play. He strikes me as maybe somebody that we're maybe going to bring in and potentially maybe loan out and have another look at him. Because when you look at our midfield, it's still reasonably strong. I know obviously Ryan missed a part of last season, but I'm not really too sure where he's going to fit into that. And I think that's obviously the concern for some supporters that maybe we still need that one quality player in that midfield because I don't think that's obviously this lad. I'll come to you next, Alan, about Fashion Sakala. Obviously now, because of the 1st of July, it is now officially a Rangers player. He is now at the club officially. You know, everything's done. What excites you about him? Are you looking forward to seeing him in the pre-season games? Well, you've done this the wrong way around. I know more about the other boy, and John obviously knows more about fashion. Um, I, I didn't know I didn't know much about fashion to be honest until I saw the, the interview that that John done for us um, a couple of weeks ago when he signed. Um, he looks he looks the part on what I've seen. I've said it before though on, on the pod. What I'm seeing is clips here or there on YouTube. You yeah. know, anybody can look good. Um, I can go and film myself a couple a couple of clips and make myself look good. So. It's hard to tell on that, but it looks apart. I've heard nothing but good things, um, you know, including John's pod and looking into it a wee bit myself. I've heard nothing but good things. If he comes in and hits the ground running, yeah, then there's no reason that he, that he, he can't be a big part of our team. I, I heard a lot of people saying, myself included, that we're screaming out for somebody that could basically do the opposite of Ryan Kent. Um, sorry, do the same as Ryan Kent, but on the opposite wing. Um, and I'm hoping we can maybe get that out to Cicala. Um, I thought... I hate to go back in time, but I thought when we sold Candace, we never really replaced that kind of player on on that side of the pitch. Um, so I'm hoping that, that he can he can maybe do that. Um, but only time will tell. We'll we'll see how he settles in. We'll see how he plays. Um, I certainly don't think he's he's here to make up the numbers or sit on the bench. Um, so it'll be exciting to see him. Um, and the boy, you know, often Rom, you know, he's the midfielder. We'll call him. We'll call him the midfielder. <laughs> I think I, I think I, that's an interesting one, and it's, I think it's been a clever bit of business, by Gerard, since we signed him, um, because we've not really nobody's really spoke about him. I know he was a Bournemouth player, and he went on loan to Wickham, but it's been very very quiet. Even when we signed Sakala, um, Gerard was asked about bringing in different players to bolster the squad, and he mentioned Scott Wright and Jack Simpson had been brought in with a view them hitting, you know, having this been their big pre-season for us, and we never really mentioned them. And how much have we spoke about? Rangers might need to sign a centre midfielder if Davis retires and Glenn Kamara leaves. Have we yeah. already done it? And I've just forgot about it. Yeah. Be- because I'll be honest, until I saw the pictures of him in the Rangers training gear the other day, I had forgot all about him. And again, I've went on and looked at a couple of clips. He looked like a big, you know, imposing driving centre midfielder. He's a young boy. He's not played a lot of senior football. But that's what we were talking about bringing in. So there's an understudy to maybe Davis for a year. So... This could be a, that could be a masterstroke by Stephen Gerrard. We've already signed the one position that, other than Goldson, we were really worried about. Yeah. So I, 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 when I remembered about him and went and had a look into him, I started to feel a lot more confident in him. Um, I, I think really think that could be a great piece of business. Right, John, over to you. Fashion Sakala. I tried to put Alan on the spot. He knew nothing, <laughs> so we'll pass over to your expertise, mate. Um, he's class, he's class, right. but he'll be uh, when you want. Uh, it's hard to tell because he's played in a new stand team where they have 
played deep. They actually played quite similar to kind of Scotland, the way they're set up with the back three. Um, and they play deep, invite teams on them, play in their own half, and then try and hit people in behind. We will not have that luxury, but he does have a trick or two. It's getting the, the consistency, the way he ended the season. If he hits the ground running here the way he ended that season, we'll be absolutely fine because his form since January was pretty much exceptional. He was one of the standouts in the league. As long as he can do that, great. Otherwise, I can see him. It might take time to adapt. But I keep caveating this all the time. Some players just don't sit in the leagues, but he seems like a very confident guy. Like when I see all his Twitter and Instagram posts, I'm like, right, he's got his, he's level headed. He seems to know what he's coming here to do. He seems to know the opportunity he's been given to come here. Um, Ustend fans loved him, and I think it'll be the same here. I think as soon as we see him play, the fans will buy into everything that he offers, and it'll just be really exciting for us. It'll be another fan's favourite, because he's in the right end of the pitch. He'll be creating chances and scoring goals, and fingers crossed, he has has a good run of fit games. Um, I, I don't think he'll start games right away. I think yeah. he'll stick with what he knows, and he'll let him bed in. But by the time we hit December, January, I think we'll, we'll need to see, see him and Kent ripping teams apart because it'll benefit Kent if we've got somebody with that similar pace on the yeah. other side of Morelos that teams just can't double up on Kent anymore and can't nullify Kent because there's now two people doing the same thing and providing we keep Morelos and he keeps doing what he was doing at the end of last season it, it, it's mental like because we, we were playing a Rebo pretty much we played a Rebo at a position loads played our field off of that right hand side as well Hadji's came in Hadji's stats are unbelievable but he still seems like he's missing that complete game yet so it could be really really exciting um, it'd be good to see Simpson now that he's bedded down with the, the system as well I just think it would be really really good to see what happens I, I said the same thing a couple of weeks ago about Calvin Bassey it'd be good to see him where a full pre-season he's seen a full year of the system because <clears throat> I was heavy critical of Barris his first six months at Rangers so I felt yeah. like he just didn't get it and then once it clicked after pre-season the next season he went flying no, I think that is a very fair point. You know, we've got to allow guys time to settle. I mean, clearly, Bastian Sakala has probably never been in Scotland in his life, potentially. <laughs> He's probably going to get a bit of a culture shock in about two months' time where it drops to pretty cold and it's maybe not the same experience that he's had in other parts of the world. But yeah, well, I mean, who's then really freezing? Who's then gets oh, cold? Yeah. Oh, well, that's right. He'll be fine in Scotland. <laughs> 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 well, I think the big thing for me is. The club have went about their business quietly. You know, I don't know how many people had actually seen Fashion Sakala play. I certainly hadn't seen, you know, anything of the lad. I'm not going to sit here and say otherwise. But since we've obviously signed him, you know, sort of out of my way to try and see if he starts games, if he's scoring, if he's assisting, try to catch bits on YouTube and stuff like that. And I can see why there's an excitement around him. He seems like somebody that, you know, sort of be always kind of like sort of gone and on and on about stats these days, don't we? We've gone about goals and we've gone about assists. And as you say, that second half of the season, his numbers were very, very impressive. And if you've got Ruth and Itten and Morelos and Ken, and, you know, I mean, that's exciting. You could be talking about adding more goals to a team that already scored a lot of goals. And this is what the club's looking at. You know, it's trying to add more quality to the squad. And even, I mean, also one of the next things we're going to talk about is Santiago Moreno, a young Colombian winger. It seems like the club are looking for more attacking threats, like more ways to put teams. Do you think that is an area of the team, Alan, that we need to add? Is that attacking part of the team? I think it's something we need to look at. Again, the conversation is probably going to circulate around about who's going to be going out, who's going to leave. Um, Again, I don't know. Sorry, wouldn't be a wouldn't be a rabble pod if there wasn't a dog gone mental in the background. That's all right. <laughs> um, um, I, th I think it's uh, sorry. It's going to circulate about who's going to leave. Um, again, he's not somebody I know much about. It looks like a, a, a sort of imposing attacking midfielder, if you like, um, that can drive forward, get a good shot, and like he can take a man on, which. I love to see um, anybody that takes a man on can, can get a shot in the Rangers team as far as I'm concerned. Um, but who's going to go? Is, who's, he going to, who's going to drop out the team to make way for this guy if we sign him? Is it a long-term replacement for our field? Um, is it Hadji? Is we looking at maybe Hadji maybe leaving whether it be this year or next year? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a, we always need to be looking at that the types of players because as long as we're successful, other clubs will be looking at our players um, so we've always got to look at replacements. So 
it doesn't surprise me that we've been, we're, we're being linked with players like this. But you said, William, about the clubs went about their business quietly. That's how Rangers always went about their business in the past. It was only when we were mismanaged from top to bottom yeah. that if there was just things constantly splattered in the papers about Rangers. 90% it was a load of rubbish. 10% had a wee snippet of truth that got leaked from somewhere. Um, so I'm really pleased that we're going back to doing our business properly. Um, we're doing our business at Okinawa and at Ibrox and we're not doing it, doing it on the daily record or the sun. Um, so the, the longer this keeps up, I'm happy. Obviously, as a, as a Rangers, as a, as a fan-led media uh, podcast, we need things to talk about. But as a Rangers fan, I'm happy that we're, we're no constantly being bombarded where Rangers are being linked with this, this, this and this. I'm happy where Rangers have signed this guy and we can go and find out about him and come on the pod and talk about him. Yeah, I think one of the questions, you know, it's a very fair point with one of the guys commenting there. Kamara and Roof are obviously suspended for the qualifiers. Is this something the club need to be proactive and get players in because they know that we're going to be without those two players? Or do we just show the trust in the players that we've got and the new signings? Or do you expect more signings to come in, John? I think we've got enough there. Right. I, I think it seemed, but the sounds of things, um, especially for the, the Euros, Ryan Jack wasn't far off um, making that. It was just a case of not he hadn't played enough games. So it sounds like, fingers crossed, they've identified this issue and they've sorted this issue finally because he's been a concern for a long time. He's not been able to play 10 games in a row for us. Yeah. Always seem to pick up niggles and knocks, but it always seems to be related, they're saying, to this one issue. So hopefully the surgery they've done and the rehab they've done and he gets pre-season under his belt uninterrupted he will come in and he will take Kamara's spot and that won't be an issue anymore. So you've still got that Kamara, Arfield and Davis in there, Aribo if you need it. But Aribo yeah, could yeah. then also just take the side off the front three that Roof would occupy, like he's done many times before, and have Morelos and Kent on the other side. So I don't think, although you would love Kamara and Roof to be available, I don't think that's the positions that would kill me. Um, I'd be more concerned if we lost that. A Barisic, a McGregor, um, Morelos. I mm-hmm. think the other positions we, we can work around. I think it's key that we've got Davis, Morelos, Barisic, McGregor. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's one of the other points on was asking is how you going to the Olympics? It looks as though he's not now. Um, Romania announced their squad earlier, and most of the more kind of talented or star Romanian players haven't been called up to the Olympic squad. I take it that's on the back of quite a few of the clubs saying, look, you're not taking our players to the Olympics. If the Rangers' point of view, I really don't think we could afford to lose Hadji. You know, to go to the Olympics, it would have been very difficult knowing where we are with the suspensions. With guys like Barris, he's going to come back a little bit late. With Hellander coming back a little bit late. We just couldn't afford for Hadji to go to the Olympics. I don't know if that was ever a real possibility, Alan. Do you think it was? I think it was a possibility. Um, I don't know how much of the decision has been taken out of the players' hands. Um, I, th- I think there's there's a different approach to the Olympics in, in different countries than there is in this country. Um, some it's political. You know, Scottish football fans, Tartan Army won't get behind a Team GB and English fans think they've got bigger fish to f- fishies to fry with the Euros and the Worlds. So we don't really bother about it in this country. And we, we sort of frown at it or turn our noses up to it. We're, we're better than that. Um, or we're better than that, or we don't want to play alongside them. Um, but in other countries around the world, the, the Olympics are taken really seriously um, by some of these countries. So had you grown up in that environment, his national team taking the, uh, taking the Olympics seriously, he might have wanted to go and play. He might have seen it as a prestigious um, competition and a chance to show himself on a, a worldwide stage. So I don't know how much of the decision has been taken at the players' hands because I think he might have wanted to go. Um, that makes me think the agreement's been reached, as you say, by the clubs and um, the Romanian Olympic Committee, as it would be, I suppose. It wouldn't be the National Football Association. It would be the Olympic Committee. Um, I just hope that it's not disgruntled him because if he did really want to go that much, he might not be happy that he's not getting to go. Um, but... You know, he's a professional football player. I think hopefully he'll understand these things. You know, his dad's been around the block a few times as well. I'm sure he'll have had a word in his ear about it. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think the decision's pretty much been taken out of his hands. Okay, that'll do it for that wee bit there. Um, we're going to move on to a player that Rangers have been linked with 
Um, I don't know how much you guys have obviously seen of Santiago Moreno. He's a 21-year-old right winger from Colombia. But it looks like he can also play in the left-hand side and in that kind of shadow striker role, if they want to call it now, it seems. Um, the quoted fee was around about $3 million. Um, I don't know if anybody's got the old changeover exchange rate there, but I think it's probably about $2 million, two and a half million. Right, John, tell us everything we need to know about Santiago Moreno. Again, YouTube clips. Um, he does look. He does look quite exciting, actually. He does yeah. look really, really fast. Um, I've seen there's been a few Premier League clubs linked to him in the last couple of weeks as well. Um, I keep seeing that. I mean, I think that his name to Twitter. There was West Ham fans talking about their link with him. Leeds fans talking about their link with him. So, if that's the level of club he's been linked with, we would probably need to act fast yeah. um, to get him. But the flip side to that is somebody coming into Rangers with no affiliation to Rangers sees a Premier League club wanting him. It's going to be hard to turn that away. So. I reckon what Alan was saying is if we're doing a business, if we're really getting this guy, we're probably already talking to him and discussing mm. terms. If not, I'm always sceptical when you hear about these stories. I feel like Rangers, like Alan said, I've seen a lot of new things. It just seems like Rangers sign people when they sign them now and you don't don't hear anything about it up to the build-up. I think Roof was maybe the exception of that recently. Um, you heard about it a couple of days before it was happening. But again, any, anyone who's adding goals and the, the numbers for his assists in the last couple of seasons... That, that's that's all good to me but it's it's making sure these players fit into what we're already doing good because you don't i really don't want to start having these white players that nullify tavernier and barisic and what we do what in our system because we could bring in the wrong players i think there's players i think there's players that we're still ignoring that are uh, scott Wright. I'm, I'm fully expecting scott Wright to be a huge player for us this year yep. so these players that we seem to be linked with sound like they might take his spot and I'm already seeing Sakala in and I'm like why Scott Wright's looked super tidy anytime he stepped on a field for Rangers. So he's someone I'd actually like to see get more game time and see what what he really has to offer. Yeah but if we're maybe going into the Champions League and think we're going into the groups, we might have to see more rotation than we have seen in the last um three seasons. You might have to see Tavernier sit out of games and Patterson come in and protect Jack watch the minutes that Davis is getting put in his legs, maybe protect Ryan Kent because he's had the odd hamstring problem as well. Morelos, just chill him out in games we don't need him. So maybe that is it, and maybe Defoe we're not able to play at this level um, after another preseason. So we don't know. But I, I would I would don't I don't want to see us filled like a massive squad of players that we only get to see yeah. like twenty odd minutes of every mm. seven weeks. I'd rather see these players regularly and see them given a chance, especially the likes of Patterson, Scott Wright, um, Hadji as well. I, I still I still think he's he's a boy that's still to land properly. And I think when he does, he, he'll be an incredible player for us. But it's just whether or not we manage to get him in there and get the timing right before he decides he has to move on. Yeah, I think the impressive thing, I mean, when you look at Hadji reporting back for pre-season, he looks, physically he looks different. You know, I don't know if that's just the work he's been doing in the off season, or whether it's just you know the work that goes on behind the scenes now at the training <laughs> ground. But he just looks different. You know, his arms look as though they've got bigger. His legs look as though they're stronger. And it's a shame when you look at like Scott Wright now. Scott Wright came in. He looked pretty, pretty skinny, pretty kind of non-existing. You look at him even five, six months later. He, he looks like a different person. And I suppose that's part of the game, though, isn't it? Like you've got to have that next level of physicality. I mean, even goals. if you've been Golson first come into Goldson now, it's like two different people. And like Katic has just went off the scale. I mean, like Katic has just turned into a bodybuilder, which is quite <laughs> scary to be honest with you. But I mean, is this just part of the modern game now, Alan, that footballers need to be in that prime condition all the time if they want to go to that next level? Yeah, I think it is. It's, footballers, they're not really getting... They're not really getting a great deal of downtime now, um, so the, the importance of staying fit is is incredible. They're not getting weeks off during the season, certainly at our level. Even when it comes to the end of the season, you know they're maybe getting a couple of weeks. If they're involved with national teams, it can be even less. That you know they're not they're not getting a great deal of downtime, so they need to look after themselves. Um, it's no surprise, you know. As I, I mentioned about Scott Wright, Scott Wright had to get out. I can't wait to see him next season because he looked good last season. Once he gets a Rangers, a Steven Gerrard pre-season under his belt at Rangers, 
he, you know, he could improve, you know, and be become one of the most important players on our team next season. Wouldn't be surprised to see him playing for Scotland at some point if he, if he keeps improving the way he was. Um, it's just it's, it's so important that players can kick on physically and keep themselves fit. The work Katic has done, you know, we saw photos of him quite regularly last season in the gym. You know, that's a mindset as well. You know, it's easy. It's easy if you pick up an injury and you're going to be out long term saying to yourself, oh, do you know what, I'm, I'm going to take a month off. I'm maybe going to go home for a month, you know, to the players, the, the, to the foreign players. Oh, I'm, I'm maybe going to take a month off and just relax and you get you fall into some bad habits and it's hard to come back for that. And we've seen that happen with other players um, in Scotland recently. They fell into their bad habits and they, they do struggle to come back for it. So that mindset in saying, no, I need to keep myself fit. If I want to be a Glasgow Rangers player, I need to keep myself in peak physical condition, even when I'm on holiday, even when I'm away from the training ground and I'm probably should be relaxing a wee bit more. I want to play for this club. I need to be... So it, it's, it's part of the modern game. But for me, more importantly, it's part of being a Rangers player now. Um, and I, I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon, especially under Gerard. It's, it's clearly part of his demands um, that, that he expects for the players that they return in a physical condition that's acceptable. Right, we're just going to skip on to the next subject. It's as though somebody's reading my mind, guys, because this was part of the agenda. OK, one of the guys is saying we have six centre-halves, unless we're going to play three at the back, two need to go. Right, John, I'm putting you on the spot. Obviously, you know the six guys that are there, Goldson, Hellander, Balligan, Simpson, Katic. Um, who's the one other? <laughs> ah, that's it. So, I mean, if you're looking at it right now and you're thinking about, obviously, Katic missed a large part of last season, pretty much the entire season. Balligan obviously had a few injury issues. He's now come back. Hellander's obviously coming back with Sweden. Goals is in the last year of his contract. Edmondson was out in loan. How do you pick the two guys that are that are potentially either going to be loaned out or sold this summer? I mean, Gerard, when we signed Hellander, Gerard said we were going to play a back three at times um, to, try and, to try and break teams down because he felt we had the wing-backs when Tavernier and Barisic that didn't need a player in front of him. And they yeah. still don't because Kent and Aribo or Roof always play inverted. If we keep Morelos, we've got Roof, Morelos, Defoe, Itten. We have a plethora of centre forwards here as well because we've got people to cover Roof's outside right position. I think what you could see is you could see us at home to lesser teams play the free at the back. Um, I would imagine it'd be more of a 3 4 3 and we'd still keep those attackers. But we might actually play those players at centre half. We might actually try that. Um, I think the problem with the day we tried it was away at Motherwell and we conceded goals and then it was like, right, let's pull that away and never look <laughs> at it again. I, I think he's overly worried that we would pick up injuries because we have picked up injuries with those players. Goldson being the absolute ex exception um, to that rule. Just super fit, always available. Um, I, I think he's probably trying to protect that. Katic has been out for a long spell. You don't know when you're going to be reduced to five. I think he wants to keep at least five and that three at the back might be something we use in games where he thinks we might need more from Morelos and Roof to occupy um, centre-halves and play the two up and play people off each other. I think that's possible. I know a lot is said about like this one system. We seem to have this system nailed. But yeah. with that comes the problem that teams can now prepare for it because mm -hmm. we know what we do. Our movements are so cyclical. You can tell what we're going to do. And that was actually the problem. I think we just now have better players that have been able to dig us out off tight games like Livingston away, Motherwell 3 1 when we turned around. Those games were just people digging in, but we still had been knocked out of two cup competitions by far lesser opposition. So we have come unstuck at times. And I think he just wants more options all the time. I think he knows he's got so many assets here to sell whenever he wants at the drop of a hat. Yeah. He's willing to, mm -hmm. to bank on having more more and more players available so I don't I don't see too many of them I think he's preparing for goals and at least been gone by the end of next season if not this season and then it's how do you keep Katic, Hellander and Balogun happy um, what do you do with Simpson and boys boys to the academy that are going to inevitably have to come through we need to start I keep saying this on this we need to start <laughs> making ourselves self-sufficient we need to start creating players not not just banking because the I cannot see a world in which we keep getting these signings so spot on. 
Glenn yeah. Kamara, yeah. Barisic, Katic, Morelos, Kent, Roof, Aribo. It's ridiculous. We're going to come a spell where we sign three or four first team players that are going to be flops and we need to try and mask against that because this can't go on because the recruitment in the last 18 months has been perfect almost. Yeah. I mean, see, just a quick point, Alan, that John makes here. I mean, is it now important, for instance, I mean, obviously Leon King, some of it's obviously in the background there. He's yep. training with the first team, 17 years old. There's some speculation that he could go out and loan in the first half of the season. Is it important that we continue to have this pathway for Leon and that obviously throughout this season, if he was to stay, if he doesn't go out and loan, that we can give him those minutes? Or... Is it now looking towards next season where, you know, Balogun could potentially leave at the end of next season, that maybe there's another player that leaves at the end of next season and that's where Leon then comes into the fold and he becomes part of the four or five? I think there needs to be a clear pathway for, for Leon, but I don't think it's going to be in the first team, certainly in the first half of the season. I think it's going to be alone. Um, we've got, you know, we've got, with his, well, we've got six centre-backs, we need if we're going to keep them, we need to keep them happy. Um, mm. Some of them will expect to play every week. Some won't. Some will know they won't play every week um, because they offer different things against different opposition. Um, and I don't see Leon benefiting from sitting on the bench. Um, all right, he might be able to play, you know, closed door games and what have you. Um, but I don't see him benefiting. So I think it will be a loan deal. I don't see him benefiting from playing in the Colts League either. I think he needs to be playing against um, in the lower league. Sorry, I think he needs to be playing against um, senior opposition at a higher level. So I think he will go out on loan. But I think it'll be clear the expectations of him on loan. You know, go in, get yourself on the first team, you know, continue to improve your reputation and there's a place here for you at Rangers. You're still a young man, still got a lot to learn. But I think that the path for Leon and probably several others will be pretty clear. Um, I know they're, they're training with the first team just now, but Gerard will probably have had, had that, the conversations about who's going out on loan and what we expect for you from, when you go out on loan. Um, you know, John mentioned about three at the back there. It, it was something I had ruled out in my head after that mother old game because that gave me the fear. Um, <laughs> the fear. I actually, I actually going to that game. I thought it was a half past twelve kickoff, so I left the pub a wee bit later than usual. And mother will up one nothing by the time I got at the ground, and I couldn't figure out why. I didn't think. <laughs> um, but that game gave uh, just we weren't really good. I know it was before the Daisy Hellander and Balligan and players like that, but. It, We've never seen it since, as far as I can remember, and I just don't think that's, no, a, that's no. a coincidence. I don't think Gerard had the faith in the centre-backs then, but he maybe has now, because we have got a good selection of centre-backs. Edmondson's the only one with a question mark over him. Gerard spoke really highly when we signed them, so he signed them for a reason. I know not every signing can work out. You know, John rhymed off a list of players there. Um, he signed, a, he signed a whole list of players there that have really worked out. But in the back of my head, all I could think was hasty, hasty, hasty. <laughs> um, so the, yeah, well, the carry on. <laughs> the carry on. Yeah, well, the carry I think on. that's always the big thing, isn't it, Alan? I mean, like, as John points out, you're never going to get everything perfect. It's just the reality of it. Well, we've been very fortunate yeah. in that the last kind of 18 months, 24 months, the overall quality of player that's come in has improved the club massively. And we're now at a level now where we maybe expect a certain quality of player to come in. And that's kind of where we are as a club. But I don't think we can look away from, as John keeps pointing out, the academy. I mean, that's something that I'm obviously hugely passionate about. I obviously do like my academy pods and stuff. So like to me, it's exciting to see so many of the guys in training with the first team. Is there anybody in that group, John, that has really impressed you while you've been out in loan? Um, I don't. I, I thought Kai, Kai Kennedy really started well. Um, right. At Rafe Rovers, I was super excited about him, but that seemed to really, really, really peter off quite quickly. And I actually think some of our best loan players are players that are going to leave. Um, Jordan Jones seemed to really hit the ground running at Sunderland, but did mm -hmm. taper off a bit. Um, Greg Docker to be sold because um, he did have such a good loan spell. Um, I don't. I wasn't really sure how Brandon Barker got on. That, that was one. I, that was one I didn't keep too close a tab on. Can't even remember where he was now. <laughs> was it Rotherham? I was Oxford, wasn't it Oxford? That's what it was. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's really hard. It's really hard for these academy boys, especially what's at stake for Gerard. This yeah. is Gerard's. As much as it's our future, this is his future. He needs mm. to prove that he can win back-to-back -back titles. He needs to prove he can get to Champions League because 
his next job is going to be a high level Champions League job. That's that's his that's his goal. So he knows that as much as he wants to bring Nathan Patterson on, James Tavernier is going to deliver him another title. James Tavernier is going to be the guy that delivers Champions League football. Um, the same with likes of Leon King. You just can't take that gamble with playing him enough games. Um, Dixon in the midfield. Yeah, he just can't take the risk, which is which is the hard part of being at Rangers. And not too many managers ever have taken the risk on youngsters. Like Barry Ferguson, Alan McGregor, Alan Hutton are the only three I can really remember coming in and making a massive, massive impact into that team. Even like the likes of Buck and Smith who broke through were good, but they never got the same chance as other people did. So I'm fingers crossed Parsons the one that stands out. Man, he's he's got he's got everything to to go right. As long as he stays away from injuries, makes right decisions, yeah. stops having house parties, um <laughs> he'll he'll have a massive, massive future, man. He'll be he'll be tremendous. No, I think that is, I mean I'm obviously hugely excited. I think like Nathan playing last season was fantastic for the Academy. I think uh, Josh going to Harrogate, I thought was a really good move. I think leaving Scotland and going to England on loan seemed to push Josh. It's obviously great to see the news today that he's obviously signed until 2024 and he's going out and loan to Morecambe in League One. Another tough test, you know. What is it? They play 46 league games in a season, then you've got the yeah. cup competition. So it's, it's a long, tough, hard season. But, you know, if Josh goes down there and does well, there's nothing to say that he's not good enough to then come back and play for Rangers. Because there's always been the argument amongst a lot of people in England, what is the Scottish Premier League level compared to England? Some people have said it's lower level championship. Some people have said it's higher level championship. You know, so I think this has always been one of those kind of silly arguments for people. Um, but I like Josh. Josh is technically very good. He's, you know, he's good enough to score goals and create goals. And it'll be interesting to see how he does it more come because clearly they're a team that don't, spend a lot of money and I would imagine a lot of people might tip them to get straight back down again so you know as long as they stay in League One next season it would probably be a pretty good season for them right moving on to the kind of last bit of the pod we're going to talk about guys who we think could potentially leave you know you've obviously brought up some of the names there Jordan Jones Brandon Barker maybe a George Edmondson etc who do you think are the obvious ones Alan that could move on this summer I think you've just rhymed them off. Um, I, I don't see, with the players we're looking at, I don't see Jones and Barker um, right. getting, getting game time anytime soon. Um, if we're going to sell a, a, a centre-back, it's going to be Edmonston. Um, I think they are the obvious ones. Um, there's, you know, um, Greg Stewart's already away. Uh, they're the obvious ones for me. I think I think the big unanswered question is who's, who's the one or two... Yeah that are going to go for big money um, or going to go for, for a reasonable amount of money. Um, that's going to be a wee, that's a wee bit harder to predict because we've got so many players who could go and so many players who are being linked with everybody just because it's, it's silly season. Um, you know, the English, every English Premier League club that says they're in the market for a player um, gets linked with somebody for Rangers and, you know, it's James Tavern, you're getting linked to Manchester United yesterday. But, come on. <laughs> He's a break. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 50 million and we'll talk. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think the obvious ones we've spoke about, they're the ones that are going to go unless something drastic changes and, you know, they've, they've went away out of loan last season and they've suddenly turned into Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, but I can't see that happening, unfortunately. Because <laughs> we John, could be doing with three Cristianos. <laughs> You know, where they can look at like Jones and possibly cash in on him, maybe get, say, half a million or a million. Maybe they can get a couple of hundred grand for Barker. They could get, I don't know how much they would get for Edmondson now, maybe half a million, a million, depending on. Is that the sort of money that the club could then use to maybe bring in another player that maybe adds a little bit of extra quality to the squad? I don't know if that'll be the problem. I think the, the 45,000 season ticket sales what yeah. brings in what 24, 25 million pounds to the club on an average kind of an average scale. That's like a ton of money. We well, maybe not myself, there's people I see on Twitter who back this club be beyond belief. Like I, I don't I don't understand how people have the, the ability to do this, but like you see people coming back for the, the Rangers merchandise stores on Saturday 
with two kits and seven training tops for their kids. And it's like, Jesus Christ, like that is, we, we don't know <laughs> what, what share we get of that money direct to the club. You would hope it's a substantial amount because we went with not not an unknown brand, but unknown in the football world yeah. um, as a brand. So you'd hope we would have a favourable percentage of that money that we get. So we have a club that is very well run. So I don't think half a million a million is going to change massively to what what we need to do. It's going to need it's going to need to be and see what actually comes in for Kamara or Barisic. I think we've said this a few times. Those are the two that I'd be I'd be really concerned about. Right. Um, Barisic missing out in the Euros probably isn't the worst thing for us, but that might mm. also then scare him into wanting a move now, mm. whilst his reputation is still hot. Because the boy who took his place for injury looked looked all right and he's 19 so there could be a case for croatia kind of resetting because a lot yeah. of the players are aging and barisic might look at that as going this is my chance to get out and get a really big move and get big money to finish my career on i, I think kamara's attracted enough interest that he would have his picks of yeah. 10 10 10th 10, 10 down to 20th of what you predict the premier league next year chasing him which would mean 10 10 12 million bids for us that kind of sale and a couple more taking up to 15 million would be what I would be looking to do. Ideally, I wouldn't want to lose these players, but I think we know where we are in Scottish football now. We're not in the Dick Advocate era where we can take people from Holland. We are now in a position where we are a certain league, and as long as we can keep ourselves at a level where we still make Europe, we still make Europe after Christmas um, and win the league, I'm more content for us to start running as an actual business and unfortunately having to say bye to players that you've idolised for three, four seasons. Mm-hmm. Right. right, well, let's end in a bit of positivity. Also, the pod's coming to the end in the next couple of minutes. Going to put you guys on the spot, right? Come the end of this season, what do you think is a successful season for Rangers? Is it just another league title, or Alan, do you want the Cups as well this year? Uh, a treble, um, Champions League, uh, um, everything, I just want everything. Um, I think we're capable, we're, we're certainly capable. Of, Competing and, and winning all the domestic trophies, um, I'd settle for. I, I, keep, I kept saying for a long time, I want a cup, I want a cup. We need to get this thing off our back about cups. I'd settle for the league, qualifying for the Champions League. Can it be underestimated how important that that's going to be for Rangers this season um, because of the financial boost? But winning the league again and automatically qualifying for the Champions League the following season, can you imagine that money coming to Rangers two years in a row? For, for me, that has to be the priority. A cup would be amazing. It'd be fantastic. Imagine, you know, after a year and a half of lockdown, oh, I was going to Hamden in May to see our team win the Scottish Cup final, beating Celtic 5-0. It would, you know, it would be fantastic, but it doesn't necessarily need to happen for me next season. For me, league qualifying for the Champions League's got to be the priorities. It's got to be. John, what about yourself, mate? What is the... You know, the be all and end all for you next year is it gets to win that league title again because it takes us into the Champions League? The league's the minimum. We need to get the Champions League money one out of two years. So the league's the minimum. And the league should always be the minimum. That should never change. I'm still massively pissed off at the teams that knocked us out the, the cups. I, I don't it it hurts more when Celtic do it, but it also hurts less when Celtic do it. Because you're going right, well, you're beaten by the one team you expect to maybe stop you winning the cup. You don't expect St. Johnson to stop you winning the cup. You don't yeah. expect St. Martin to stop you winning the cup. And Celtic were out the cup both times when we got knocked out. And that is the absolute kick in the teeth because that should have been an unbeaten, clean sweep, domestic treble. And we would have all this nonsense about real invincibles at the window because we shut off in the last minute of our corner against St. Johnson and Ryan Kent didn't clear his lines against St. Martin after we get back in the game. Both those things don't happen we're fine and we go on and win those tournaments as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. it, is, it is just that, but win the league. Win the league, make sure we get Champions League money next year and that maybe, you maybe then have to sell Morelos at the end of next season and that recoups the Champions League money you just missed out on if we don't make the group stages. But God, the, the dream world is making group stage treble and then that's us just sail off at its sunset of probably the best two seasons back to back we've had in a very, very long time. Yeah, well, I think that's what we should always look for. I think we should expect to win everything that we have in Scotland. I mean, I certainly grew up, you know, with my dad always telling me that, you know, we should win everything. And that's never left me. You know, I know, obviously, during those tough years in League Two and League One in the Championship, and it's tough watching your biggest rivals winning things. But 
you know, now that we've won the league, we've just got to go again and we've got to go again and again and again because that's just how how we want as a support. Like we want to just keep winning things. It's what we now expect. It's what we demand from every one of these players. And I'm already looking forward to next season. I genuinely can't wait. I hope, like you two guys, the league again is massive. The automatic spot in the Champions League. I mean, financially, you can't even, you know, kind of talk too much about it because it's just such a huge amount of money. And if you were to get it two seasons in the trot, I mean, that's just, it's monstrous for a club in Scotland these days. And it shows you how important that money is. You know, sort of the Europa League money's been great, but the Champions League money's next level. And it's something as a football club we need to aspire to and we need to keep pushing for. And I hope, you know, we have a really strong off season. All being well, guys, we're hoping to do a reaction pod on Monday after the Partick Thistle game. Um, hopefully a comfortable Rangers win. Maybe some new contract news, maybe a new signing. You never know. That's always the hope in the back of our mind when we're refreshing Twitter every 15 seconds to see what's happening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, guys, thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate you taking your time out, your busy schedules to listen to us talk about Rangers. I know all you guys feel the same way as us. Thanks again. Um, we'll see you again hopefully Monday night with the reaction to the Partick Thistle game. Take care of yourselves and we'll speak to you soon.